All right, good morning, everyone. Let's get session four started. I am Kelly Kaysen, Executive Director of Think Kids, and I'm happy to welcome you to session four of the Health and Hunger Summit series. This is a virtual series where we will take a candid look at connections between the healthcare system and community resources that address hunger in West Virginia. Health and hunger are profoundly connected. Their systems should be too. You can find more information on our website, thinkkidswv.org, and on our Think Kids Facebook page. And we hope you'll help join the discussion because more than ever in this moment, we need to unite in our efforts to ensure that all West Virginians are as healthy as they can be with access to healthcare and nutritious food. There are a lot of challenges to this, and so we're glad you're here with us today. Now we know that a lot more West Virginians than usual are on the internet right now, and so if you get disconnected or have difficulties hearing, please know that this is being recorded and will be shared on our social media sites this afternoon. Also, you'll have the opportunity to share your thoughts and questions at the end of the panel discussion. Go ahead and type them into the Q&A or chat box while they're fresh in your mind, if you'd like, and we will get to them at the end. And with that, let's get underway by thanking our sponsor for the event series, Unicare Health Plan of West Virginia, and introducing Tad Haynes, president of Unicare. Thanks a lot, Kelly. And good morning, everybody. On behalf of Unicare Health Plan of West Virginia, I'd like to welcome you to the Health and Hunger Summit Series, the first summit of its kind in our state to build bridges between the healthcare delivery system and community food resources. We know that health and hunger are connected, and for this reason, so should the systems that provide care. We'd like to express our gratitude to the panelists and attendees for joining us today for session four, bringing health and hunger resources to the same table. As the summit series comes to a close, we've brought national and state health and hunger policy experts to the same table to ask, how can we use what we, we've learned from the first three sessions to promote positive policy change between the healthcare and food access system? What role can we have as community members to inform and elevate this important discussion? We hope this is an interactive session. Your input and insight are valuable to creating a larger discussion in our state to address these disconnects, which in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic is a critical conversation to have. And so thank you for joining us. Unicare Health Plan is a Medicaid managed care organization that has been serving West Virginia since 2003 and is part of the Anthem family. Through our work with vulnerable populations throughout the country, we know that there is a strong linkage between health and access to social and economic opportunities. The conditions in which we live oftentimes explain in part why some of us are healthier than others. Living in, a, in poverty, living in a food desert, or living in a situation where there is a question of where your next meal will come from are all factors that can cause poor health outcomes that have to be addressed by the healthcare system. For these reasons, we are proud to sponsor the summit and partner with the Think Kids organization led by Kelly Caseman. Kelly, thank you for your leadership and your organization in putting these sessions together. Thank you, Tad. And with that, let's get underway by introducing our first panelist. She is Alexandra Ashbrook, and she is the Director of Special Programs and Initiatives with Food Research and Action Center, which is FRAC. At FRAC, Alex works to drive new initiatives to improve public policies and partnerships to end hunger in the United States. She spearheads FRAC's efforts to reduce food insecurity among adults and immigrants and engage the anti-hunger network and permissible election-related activities to build the political will necessary to end hunger. She also works to highlight the intersections of hunger and health, co-leads the Hunger Vital Sign Community Practice with Children's Health Watch, and develops resources, including a toolkit and partnership with the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, for healthcare stakeholders to support food insecure patients and address social determinants of health. She helps build out partnerships with organizations, including those representing veterans, military families, and the LGBTQ communities. From 2007 to 2015, Alex served as the director of DC's Hunger Solutions, an initiative of FRAC, during which she led efforts to create a hunger-free community, improve the nutrition, health, economic security, and well-being of low-income residents of the nation's capital. From 1996 to 2006, she served as a senior program director at Street Law, the national nonprofit dedicated to transforming democratic ideals into citizen action. She received her Juris Doctor Magna Cum Laude and her Master's of Law from Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you for joining us today, Alex. 
Thanks so much, Kelly. I'm so delighted to be here. I know we've been planning this for a few months now, and thanks to Tom and Unicare for um, sponsoring this fabulous convening. Um, a word on frack. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary of research and advocacy to end hunger in America. And I encourage you to check out our website and resources um, that can help you uh, do the work to address food insecurity. Um, as, as Kelly mentioned, I direct special projects and initiatives at FRAC, um, and my work includes partnering with health and medical organizations to, uh, to help them address food insecurity among their patients and families at the practice level and in the advocacy arena. Next slide. So a quick word on food insecurity. Um, food insecurity basically exists when a family does not have sufficient access at all times to the nutritionally adequate and safe foods necessary for an active and healthy life. And it's no surprise to any of you that food insecurity has a range of negative consequences. It harms health, it reduces one's ability to learn, um, it reduces one's productivity, um, and there are reams and reams of research um, showing how the consequences of food insecurity and even marginal food insecurity, which is, a, which is a level that's less severe, are especially detrimental to the health of children. Um, just some examples of how food insecurity is detrimental to children's health includes they're having a lower health status, um, iron deficiency anemia, more frequent colds and stomach aches, asthma, developmental risk, mental health problems, and poor educational performance. And unfortunately, the list goes on and on. And we know that these have severe consequences for families, both in the short term and in the long term, and also have severe consequences for the health and well-being of our, of our nation. Um, more than 35 million Americans live in, in households that struggle against hunger, and that means that nearly one in eight households with children live in a food insecure household. And unfortunately, these rates are disproportionate um, to some groups. Rates of food insecurity are higher among households with children, in Black and Hispanic households, in rural communities, and in the Southern regions. So next slide, please. Before I get to um, COVID-19 and, and food insecurity, I just wanted to give you a sense of food insecurity trends um, during the last um, few decades and point out that these are trends for households with children. Um, the, the top line looks at households with children and their food insecurity rates. And what that means is that some member of the household is experiencing food insecurity. We don't know which member, and we, but what, what, what we do know is that adults often sacrifice their own nutrition and health and eat fewer calories, um, skip meals so that their children can eat. The, the second line looks at food insecurity rates where children are actually experiencing um, lack of food. And the bottom line is the worst form of food insecurity, which is basically hunger. And those are children experiencing hunger. So just, just note, this will not come as a shock to you, that food insecurity rates went up across all three categories during the start of the um, Great, Great Recession um, in December of 2017. And they continue to go up. Um, what, is, what is different is that while the Great Recession was typically viewed as ending in um, June of 2009, you can see food insecurity rates didn't get to their pre-recession levels until 2015, which is an indication that families at lower incomes had a much harder time recovering from the economic turmoil of the Great Recession than some of the other households who had recovered by 2009. Um, so even, even as we've recovered in 2019 and rates have gone down, it's really important to note that still way too many um, families are affected by food insecurity. If we're looking at um, children in food insecure households, um, children who were food insecure, we have 6.5%, and this is the middle line, of US households with children, 2.4 million households had um, a child who was unable at times to access adequate nutritious food. Next slide, please. 
So now on to the really terrible situation of food insecurity during the pandemic. Um, and, and these um, photos are, are bearing out all over the um, country. And, and you'll be hearing um, from Caitlin about the Mountaineer Food Bank and what it's seen in terms of lines and people um, trying to access desperately needed food. Uh, so the rates, we know that the rates have escalated um, they've disproportionately affected Black and Latinx and Indigenous um, households. Um, and we also know that the, rate, the food insecurity is deeper. Um, here's, a, here's a stat that's, that's I mean, should, should shock you. Um, about 10% of all adults across America, <clears throat> excuse me, reported their households sometimes or often didn't have enough to eat in the last seven days, according to the latest data. Um, and again, these figures are even higher for Black and Latino adults, with 19% of Black and 17% of Latin, Latino adults reporting this hardship. And remember, this is in the last um, few weeks, whereas the food insecurity numbers that I, I talked about during the trends, they come out in every September and are based on the entire year. So they're, they're already stale. They were for 2019, but they give you a sense of the fact that we were making progress and now um, that progress has just been obliterated during this um, pandemic. Next slide. So what I want to focus my, um, the remainder of my time on is the federal nutrition programs and how these programs are key health interventions and support for those experiencing food insecurity. And what's unique about these programs are they're available wherever you may live. Um, and while the food banks are doing Herculean work to connect families to food, they can't do it alone. We need to leverage these programs. Um, one, one stat that may be helpful to you is that Feeding America prior to the pandemic said that for every one meal they provide, SNAP provides um, nine. So these programs can really be leveraged to bring in federal funding to provide meals. Um, so here's a, a list of the programs um, and you can see there's a range of programs. Most are administered by the USDA, um, Food and Nutrition Service, but some are administered um, over at HHS through the Administration on Community Living, and those are programs for older adults, 60 plus. Um, let's talk a little bit um, about the programs overall. They're, they're, they're entitlement programs, which base, with the exception of WIC, um, which basically means that if you have people who qualify, they'll be able to access the programs. Um, unlike housing vouchers, you may have thousands of people who qualify for a housing voucher, a Section 8 voucher, but they're long um, wait lists to get those vouchers. So that's one of the main attributes of these programs. They can be expanded in times of need. So just a quick word on SNAP. I think most of you are very familiar with it, but what may um, you may not know is that about 50% of all um, people in the US under 30 have at one point in their life benefited from SNAP. Currently more than 36 million people participate in SNAP and SNAP benefits are loaded onto an EBT card, um, looks just like a credit card, which reduces the stigma and you can use it at local groceries, corner stores, um, farmers markets, CSAs. Um, and not only does SNAP help families put food of their choosing on the table, but it also helps the economy recover. For every dollar a customer spends in SNAP, it generates about a dollar and 17 cents in local, a dollar and 79 cents in local economic activity. As wonderful as SNAP is, there's one shortcoming, and for those of you who work with families and connect them to SNAP, you probably hear about this shortcoming. The benefit just isn't adequate to get people through, um, out through the month um, in most instances. So one of the things we really push for at FRAC is to increase the SNAP benefits so they actually can last throughout the month and provide people with the nutrition they need for a healthy life. There are a host of programs for children and they reach tens of millions of children each day. Um, one of the programs are uh, school meals. So schools can serve breakfast, lunch, um, after school suppers. Um, they can participate in summer meals as can faith-based groups, um, rec centers, ch child, children serving agencies. And um, 
FRAC has a, a school breakfast scorecard we publish every year to look at what states are doing the best job in connecting um, kids to free breakfast. And West Virginia has ranked number one in the country for uh, probably the past 15 years. So give yourself a pat on the back. You're a national model for improving access to school breakfast. These are programs that I encourage you to take a look at if you're um, any type of youth serving agency or partner with youth serving agencies. Um, once people meet the requirements for participating in the programs, they can draw down federal funding to feed kids nutritious meals. So if you partner with um, a church that has an after school program, they can, they can access some of this funding um, potentially. And as you know, if, if, if the kids are fed, that's a big draw to get kids to programming. It's also a big draw in terms of, of budgets. You can use the money that you were uh, spending on food for other needs. Now, of course, during the pandemic, we're, we're not congregating um, together for the most part. So there, there are some waivers and new rules that are helping people access these programs in, in wake of the need to social distance. Uh, just wanted to say a few words about WIC, which is such a critical program um, for low-income pregnant people, breastfeeding parents, postpartum par parents, and infants and children. Now, the, the thing that um, we do a really good job in is getting people to participate in WIC who are infants. So from zero to one, um, half the babies in America are benefiting from WIC. What happens is when kids turn one, there's a big drop off from WIC. Um, even though children are eligible to WIC up until their fifth birthday. And this is a great program to really work to connect families to, um, especially during the pandemic because some of the um, waivers have made it much easier to access the program. Um, and FRAC has materials to promote WIC to um, the age co cohort, well, all age cohorts, but specifically once a kid turns one. Basically, people will get a, a child will get about forty to sixty dollars in in WIC uh, benefits to purchase tailor, tailored foods to that particular child. So fruits and vegetables, milk, um, are some of the typical foods. Um, and and many people don't realize that you can be on WIC and SNAP at the same time. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about. Um, some of the benefits of the programs to health and well-being, and then you know, reserve time at the end of all the panelist discussions if you have specific questions about each any of the programs, um, just because we don't have time to delve into them in detail. So the federal nutrition programs, um, I like to call them miracles of public policy because they do so much besides what they're set up to do, which is to get to address food insecurity. They help alleviate poverty. They um, improve dietary quality. They improve health and well-being. So there are just so many attributes of these programs. And again, I'll, I'll connect you to research on how fabulous the programs are for improving health and well-being. Next slide, please. So COVID-19. Um, we're, in, we're in a new world in terms of how we um, serve um, people food. Um, schools obviously aren't having the cafeteria open. Um, you know, if, if they're even open to begin with. So there have been some good responses during COVID-19. Um, the first I want to highlight is um, states have been issuing emergency supplemental SNAP benefits, which are temporary. Um, they're only issued until the public health crisis ends, which is still ongoing, unfortunately. But what these benefits do is they help families by giving every family participating in SNAP the maximum SNAP benefit amount. So think of your senior um, who was maybe getting just $16 a month for a household of one. Now she or he is getting $194 a month. Um, if you had a household with kids, uh, a household of three who was only getting $230 a month based on their earnings, now they're getting $509 a month. So I think there's a real opportunity to, to get information on how those additional benefits are really helping people during COVID-19 when people have lost jobs and food prices have, have gone up. Um, what's missing in this response is if households were already getting the maximum amount, 
for their household side, they are not getting any additional help from SNAP. And that's 40% of households. And it's households that typically are our lowest income households and households with kids who are already not having enough SNAP benefits to get food. So, so that's a gap. Um, there are other things that are happening with SNAP. Um, West Virginia was improved for online um, grocery purchasing. Um, which has potential to be huge, help, huge, hugely helpful, but you know it's it's only being implemented in in, in modest in instances at this point. Um, the the program that's just been a godsend for for children is PEBT, and PEBT um, basically provides nutritional resources to families whose kids have lost access to free or reduced price school meals. Um, and families get, if school's been closed five days, they get money to replace the meals lost on an EBT card. And fortunately, there's some good news. PEBT was just extended in the um, recent um, uh, congressional um, resolution um, to, to keep the government open. So um, PEBT is still available if schools have shuttered. Um, and it's also is going to be including kids who are, were in childcare. Um, the other responses are waivers. There have been a host of waivers for SNAP and other nutrition programs to make it easier to access the programs. Um, so some of the waivers may be, you know, you don't have to go in person to apply or recertify for WIC. Um, for SNAP, you may not have to do, um, you know, as, as much um, paperwork or you have extensions on the paperwork. And each state has taken advantage of different waivers. Um, West Virginia um, COVID-19 waivers, if you just Google that, it will take you to the USDA landing page and you can see what waivers your state has taken. Um, one of the most important waivers that has happened, and this is nationwide, is that um, schools can now opt to continue their meal service through the summer nutrition program. Um, which I don't want to get into the weeds, but it basically allows schools to be able to serve meals um, for free and minimizes the um, paperwork they need to do to make sure that they can, you know, take advantage of some new models where, you know, they may be distributing food um, out of the parking lot and parents can pick up the food. Um, so that's been a huge, huge win um, for getting fit, children fed during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, even so, we're, we're seeing such high rates of hunger and um, need still that we, we really need to um, focus on doing more to feed our families struggling with hunger. And one of the things that um, FRAC and other anti-hunger groups are, are pushing for is um, getting a next um, coronavirus relief package that includes a SNAP boost um, by 15%, you know, to help all families, increasing the minimum SNAP benefit, and then making sure we suspend some of these horrible rules that are in the pipeline that would make it harder for people to access SNAP and get a, um, a, the benefit for which they are due. So um, we have lots of information on how you can join um, advocacy around pushing um, our leaders to really um, step it up in terms of um, the COVID-19 response. So just wanted to, um, before I close out, just let you know that FRAC has some, um, some materials on our website that may be of particular interest to you. We have a hunger and health series um, that looks at, you know, um, not only why food insecurity and poverty have such detrimental health impacts, but also how the programs are great interventions. Um, we also co-host the Hunger Vital Sign Community of Practice with Children's Health Watch. And um, one of the things we're pushing for are for groups, um, health groups to issue statements, um, engage in advocacy, um, and really lift up the importance of um, a, a response to food insecurity. Um, as Ted said, it really is a social determinant of health. Um, and healthcare partners have such trusted voices in this space. So if you're interested in contacting me and getting more information um, or have questions that, I, that we won't have time to answer today, please do so. Here's my information. And um, look forward to hearing from um, the other panelists. 
Thank you, Alex. We're, I'm, I'm so thankful that you joined us today and uh, that wealth of information you just shared with us. And I'm going to move right along to um, Caitlin Cook. She is the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy at Mountaineer Food Bank. A Charleston, West Virginia native, Caitlin has spent her professional career researching, addressing, and helping inform debates around a variety of policy issues that impact West Virginians. In her current role, Caitlin enjoys the opportunity to connect policymakers with experiences, perspectives, and needs from one of West Virginia's two food banks to better inform security, uh, food security policy and working towards a, um, a hunger-free West Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us today, Caitlin. Thanks for having me, Kelly. And Tad, thank you and your organization for sponsoring this. And Alex, that was, a, a, as Kelly said, a wealth of information. Um, I just want to begin by, you know, talking a little bit about Mountaineer Food Bank. As Kelly mentioned, we're one of two food banks in the state uh, facing hunger, which is in the Huntington area is the other food bank. Uh, both of the food banks are members of the Feeding America Network. And that is a network that has more than 200 food banks across the country. Uh, specifically for Mountaineer, we are a nonprofit. We are centrally located in Gassaway, which helps us um, meet the increased need in our state as well as, um, you know, as far as transportation and getting to the places we need. That location is key in making the logistics a little bit uh, easier for us. Um, we are a growing operation right now. We've got 50 plus employees and right now we have four locations. Uh, within this last month, we just opened a warehouse operation in Weston. Um, recently, we, we thought we were going to be able to have a ribbon cutting ceremony at our new Rock Branch location, which is in Putnam County, um, but that has been postponed. And then we have an office space now in Flatwoods. Um, and I'll talk about this a little later, but that Weston and Rock Branch, um, those facilities that provide us um, extended and increased capacity as far as storage has been huge during our COVID-19 response. Um, and, you know, we've got 460 partner feeding programs that help us fulfill our mission um, to feed West Virginia's hungry through our network of member feeding programs and engage the state in the fight to end hunger. Um, and when we talk about these programs, it could be schools, it could be libraries, it could be community organizations, it could be your local food pantry, um, any of those. Kelly, if you could do the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Mountaineer is the state's largest emergency food provider. Uh, we distribute more than 20.7 million pounds annually. And as COVID-19 has tested our capacity and our bandwidth as the state's largest emergency food provider, right now Mountaineer is on track to put out uh, 28 million pounds. So that is almost an 8 million pound increase um, from last year. So I think that speaks to the uh, volume of need that we are seeing right now. Uh, the feeding programs that Mountaineer provides, it's a variety. I don't think um, many people understand how many ways a food bank helps communities across the country. Um, we're talking food pantries, soup kitchens, senior programs at your senior centers, veterans tables across the state, your mobile pantry programs that folks can come out to in the community when they hear of it, uh, get in line with the cars, get in line. Um, just coming into a place that is facilitating these um, school food pantries, backpack programs, and summer feeding programs. There's a variety of ways that Mountaineer is getting out into the various communities it serves. Um, if you see on the map, the green and blue are the areas of the state that Mountaineer serves. We are in 48 of the state's 55 counties. Interestingly enough, that Rock Branch facility that I mentioned earlier is in Putnam County, which is one of the few counties that we do not serve, but are grateful that Facing Hunger is able to pick that up. Um, but Putnam, having that warehouse there, allows us to have deliveries from the programs that we facilitate, uh, the Summer Food Service Program, the Child and Adult Care Food Program, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, you know, that Alexandra alluded to coming in from the USDA. Um, that's a big, big part of what we do, but having that facility in Putnam County makes it much easier for us to reach the folks in Southern West Virginia that we are asked to serve. Um, you know, Mountaineer receives assistance from federal and state funds, but the majority of funding comes from grants, businesses, and individual donors. Um, and we've really seen uh, that tested recently. And also an outpour of people donating 
um, when a lot of folks are, are down right now, economically, um, I, I think mentally, this has all been a test on us. Kelly, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, just some quick facts. I know Alexandra gave us um, some great shots as far as uh, nationwide, but one in seven in West Virginia are food insecure. One in five kids in West Virginia are food insecure. Um, over two, 260,000 individuals in the state of West Virginia are food insecure. Um, that is nearly 15% of our state's population. And, you know, as Alexandra mentioned before, uh, COVID-19, this pandemic is only exacerbating the food insecurity. Uh, a recent report from Feeding America shows that food insecurity in the state of West Virginia is likely to increase in every single one of our state's counties. Kelly, if you could go to the next slide, please. All right. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit specifically about some of Mountaineer's programs um, that are facilitated, you know, through these federal programs that we are able to do. Um, it's been talked about the importance of child nutrition and how it serves as a foundation to success. Um, if we can mitigate hunger early, these kids are going to have a better chance at a better life. Um, so there are three programs that I think uh, Mountaineer does um, extremely well and are very kid focused. Uh, the first one I want to talk about was established in 2017. Um, it is our Fresh Initiative Kids Market. And this is pretty cool because it not only provides food for these kids, but it also gives them the lessons behind why nutrition is so important and it empowers them to kind of have that market buy-in. When, when I say that, I mean they are literally doing the shopping themselves. They are given recipes, they are given lessons as far as how to cook, how to prepare these meals, but that connection is made not only that, hey, here is this so you don't go hungry, but here's why this food specifically is going to be better for you. Here is this important connection between the food that you're going to be able to take a bag, go around this market, and select what you want to create. And it's also, you know, a creative process. Um, so this program serves elementary age kids, um, and it's regardless of income. So it is something, you know, when we talk about the SNAP program and reducing the stigma as far as a SNAP EBT card looking exactly like a credit card, this is something that, you know, it, it is an all in as far as your classmates, you're doing this together. Um, so each school is sponsored by a grant and that is uh, the grant funding goes for all of these um, kids specific programs that Mountaineer does. So unfortunately, while we serve 48 out of the 55 counties, these programs are not in all of the counties that we serve. Um, so, you know, you can see there, the, the kids receive a seven to 10 pound bag of produce. They receive recipes, nutritional information, education on plants and agriculture. And I know Spencer would be able to talk a little bit more about the connection between food security and agriculture, but we wanna make sure that we're making those ties and those connections for kids so they can see the bigger picture um, in a fun way too. Um, you know, each kid gets to go shopping. They're picking out what they want. Um, the program started in four counties with one elementary school in each. It has now grown to over 10 counties and 38 elementary schools. Uh, you know, and it serves a, a wide variety when we're thinking about the population and where food insecurity is in the state of West Virginia. It's not just rural, it's not just urban. Unfortunately, it's everywhere. And this program is serving schools that have as few as 100 students as well as as large as 650. So I think it's important to note that. Um, and these counties are participating um, in this program year to year. So it is, it is likely to change. Um, and for any of these programs or as far as getting involved, being an agency with Mountaineer, um, if you go on our website, you'll be able to connect with those programs. Um, Kelly, if you could switch to the next slide, please. All right, our summer feeding program. Uh, this has been, I would say a trying summer for everybody, but this program's capacity has very much been tested during COVID-19. Um, this was started as, as well in 2017. Um, we all know the importance that schools play um, in a child nutrition here in West Virginia. Um, Alexandra mentioned, you know, as far as breakfast is concerned, the state of West Virginia has been a leader nationwide. Um, well, that means in summer, our kids are, you know, they've really struggled to access those meals that have been so consistent during the school year. Um, so Mountaineer Meals is a summer feeding program and it bridges that gap. It makes sure that while kids aren't in school that they have access to food. 
Um, Mountaineer, you know, we partner with libraries, we partner with family resource networks um, to distribute that food and make that happen. Um, currently, we are serving Braxton, Calhoun, and Mercer counties. Um, some facts as far as, you know, how much this program has been tested during COVID-19. Um, last summer, it was about averaging 10 to 15 kids per site. Um, this year, we had three sites in Braxton County. We served 357 families and 746 kids. In Calhoun County, the site serves 223 families and 520 kids. Mercer County, which is the newest county that's added to this program, served 78 households and 150 kids. Uh, during the beginning of summer, uh, Tabitha, who is one of our program staffers, she had headed up this program and Calhoun specifically, we had, at the beginning, we did not anticipate such a great need. Um, so we ended up taking food out there. We had a truck come in right after the initial truck arrived because the lawn was so big, the need was so high. Um, and it ended up that day that we had scheduled to have one truck there for that summer feeding program. We had another truck follow up and still there were kids that were there that wanted meals. So the next day we sent a truck. So I can't stress on um, the enormous increase in need as far as the summer feeding program has experienced this year. Um, it was one of the, I think, most difficult things that we have had to navigate, those logistics. Um, we could have all of the food in the world, but it's also about, specifically in these rural communities, picking locations, making sure people know that it's there, making sure people have the transportation to get to the location. Um, many times, whether it was a summer feeding program or just your mobile pantry, you had people that A, we'd never seen before, um, B, that, and, and by the looks of it, you might not think that they would be in a situation where they need to come uh, to a mobile food pantry drive through um, But you would also have a tremendous amount of people that were walking on foot to these places. And if you have seen uh, a mobile food pantry drive through hopefully we are able to give you uh, a pretty robust box of meat, a box of non-perishable items, some milk. So you would have um, you would have children trying to carry this, trying to help their adults. And I think that really goes to show um, how great the need has been um, during this pandemic. You know, we we saw a thirty percent increase overall in need. Um, but the the summer feeding program and that Calhoun County experience. I think that is unfortunately um, very likely to be happening in other counties. And right now, while we were able to expand to Mercer County, we would love to grow the program in the future. Um, Kelly, if you could go to the next slide, please. The um, backpack program, that is the oldest of our kids specific programs that we facilitate. It was established in 2010. And I think this is, you know, a program that is designed to make sure, you know, those kids who don't have enough food to eat on the weekend, as we mentioned before, schools play such a pivotal role in, in, in creating that foundation for childhood nutrition, whether it's, you know, just having the food, whether it's educating them on nutrition, offering them opportunities to be creative and learn about recipes. Uh, this is, again, one of those programs that gets kids where they are so we can make sure that they're not hungry when they're not there and they have that steady supply of food and nutrition. Um, this program serves 39 counties. Uh, again, it's one of the oldest ones. It has grown quite a bit. Uh, you know, in 2019, we served nearly 8,000 kids. Um, they're provided with a backpack every week. Um, this is something that you, uh, here in Kanawha County, we have um, Ruth Lawn Elementary. And there's a church right near Ruth Lawn, uh, a Nazarene church. They do a tremendous job as far as being an agency member operating a food pantry, but they also participate in this backpack program. So you have parishioners from that church that are working with the school system that's literally, I think, half a mile away, uh, packing these backpacks, getting them ready for kids. So it's a very um, seamless way to provide these kids with what they need on the weekends. And again, I can't stress it enough how great these programs are meeting the kids where they already are, mitigating stigma. Um, you know, the backpacks, the snacks are fun. 
Uh, I will say we have done our best to increase their nutritional value. Um, unfortunately, we all know the fact that uh, unhealthy food is cheaper than healthier food. Um, so these programs, they really do put a focus on making sure that what's being put in these bags so kids have or what they're creating um, kind of at these, these recipe workshops are nutritious and they're learning that lesson. Uh, Kelly, if you want to continue, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, now to, to talk about COVID-19 and our response. Um, I will say that I started at the food bank right in March. So for me, I, I don't have a pre-COVID food bank experience. Um, I have dabbled in the food security policy world before, but never so intensely. So from my perspective, this has been something as far as, you know, Alexander mentioned the waivers on the federal level that had increased people's ability uh, to meet people where they are and give them more food that kind of changed the flexibilities for programs. It has been something um, that is amazing to watch. And I, I apologize for my dog in the background. He is a little needy, but he's adorable and awesome. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Uh, so just to talk about our response in general, you know, when the pandemic happened and I'm, I'm going to let him into the room he wants to be in so he can be a little quiet. Uh, when the pandemic happened, we immediately switched from our regular programs um, to assembling uh, emergency food boxes. And that was through the TFAT program. Uh, Kelly, could you go one slide forward, please? Thank you. Sorry. Um, and to be honest, Mountaineer could not have done what it did without the help of the West Virginia National Guard. Um, we had, I forget how many guardsmen we had in there, men and women, um, but with the National Guard's help, we were able to assemble an average of 1,200 boxes per day. So these boxes went out through our footprint in the state, whether it be through a mobile food pantry, whether it was from a, uh, to our regular agencies, we made sure these boxes got out um, to meet that need. And we still did um, a good bit of our regular programming, but the, the focus of the food bank shifted when COVID-19 happened. It completely shifted to assembling these emergency food boxes. And while we had another program that we're gonna talk about here in a second, kind of ease that burden a little bit from us having to focus on those emergency food boxes, uh, that has still been a, a huge thing of what we're doing in response. Uh, the increase in need, unfortunately, as it's been said before, it's here to stay. Uh, one thing I do wanna talk about that I think it's important when you talk about the food bank and everything that goes on in it, um, and COVID-19 specifically, I think there were a lot of questions as far as food sourcing. We know the need is great. So have food banks, have agencies uh, throughout the US, have they been able to get the food they need to meet the increased need? As of right now, yes, uh, it's been adequate. I think in the beginning, um, as all of us experienced when we went to the grocery store and we saw the shelves bare, there was a little bit of that you know, scared reaction. You're gonna get everything you can right here, right now. Um, but for the most part, food sourcing for the food bank has been adequate. Uh, the demand for food, it most certainly increased. Uh, donations as far as, in, in the beginning, as far as personal and as far as, you know, our corporate partners. And when I say corporate, I mean your Kroger's, your Walmart's, your local stores, because their shelves were bare, they didn't have anything to give us at the food bank. So at the same time that we saw our need increase, we saw our charitable donations go down. Uh, with that increase in need, you know, we saw our transportation costs skyrocket because we were going more places uh, multiple times. Our storage needs, uh, I mentioned this before, with the help of that Weston facility and Rock Branch facility, how better prepared Mountaineer is going to be to meet that increased need. Uh, those storage needs, they skyrocketed. Um, you know, and the programs, as Alexandria mentioned, when you talk about the waivers, they provided much needed flexibility. They enabled us to, to work smarter, not harder. Um, and I do want to focus on that storage and the transportation costs right now a little bit. Um, one of the biggest challenges, at least for your food banks, in meeting the need to address food security is the storage need, uh, specifically when it comes to cold and refrigerated storage. 
Uh, we have got a, a pretty big facility in Gasaway. The new facility that we have in Weston is double the space that we have in Gasaway. So now that we are able to actually store more food, we're gonna be able to be better prepared when this happens again. Um, hopefully it doesn't happen like this again, but when there is such an increase in need that we are able uh, to meet that right then and there because we've already got the supply. Um, but a big thing for us right now, you know, I talk about that Weston facility and providing, you know, a, a huge increase in storage capacity, but it doesn't right now, it's not fitted for cold storage. It doesn't um, meet the need when we talk about transportation. Uh, you can have a box truck, you can have uh, all of the box trucks you have, but if it doesn't provide that refrigeration, we still can't get the food that people need uh, to the Eastern Panhandle, to Southern West Virginia. Um, so those two items, I think, had been our biggest obstacles when responding uh, to the to the pandemic and that increase in need. Um, Kelly, if you go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, so these two programs, TFAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and CFAP. Uh, CFAP is a little, little tricky and we'll get there, but that was um, a program that is very, very new and came out uh, in response to COVID-19. Uh, the TFAP program, you know, it helps hungry Americans and farmers. Um, it is part of a, a trade mitigation. Um, it, it gives them a boost, but the TFAP uh, program, it includes entitlement purchases that are done through the farm bill that Congress passes. Um, and then there are bonus commodities. Those are purchased by USDA, uh, hopefully annually, um, and they provide market support. Um, you know, the additional program funding that was provided through two of the uh, COVID-19 response relief bills that Congress passed, uh, they were instrumental in making sure that uh, food banks could actually buy all the food that they needed. Um, and again, those waivers, they provided tremendous flexibility as far as distribution and procedures are concerned. And I think Alexandra mentioned it, when we talk about procedures, we talk about the information that is needed before you can provide one of these TFAP, TFAP boxes, um, as far as the organizations that you're working with, how you have to do that. Um, so those were big helps. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about TFAP here in a second. Kelly, if you can go back, I wanna talk about the CFAP program briefly. Uh, so as I mentioned, this program uh, facilitated, both these programs are USDA facilitated programs. The CFAP program, um, it came out uh, early on in the pandemic, you know, kind of had two prongs. It was financial aid for food suppliers like Cisco, U.S. Foods, um, and it also was aimed at uh, helping hungry Americans. Um, our experience with the CFAP program, it has been uh, complicated, I think, because it was a new program and because it was at such a high time of need. Um, there were, as far as uh, logistics, there were a lot of questions because you were trying to merge two universes. One, the, the food bank world that is in, in the game of storing, in the game of transporting, and in the game of feeding West Virginians and Americans. Uh, the other world you have, you know, it's a, a food supplier. They want to bring a box, drop it off, and get on their way to their next delivery. Um, so it, it was very difficult at first, and I think every time that you connected with a new provider, uh, right now we are in the, the last phase of this program. Um, we are working with Cisco at Mountaineer Food Bank. Um, each time that you have a new phase, and if you match up with a new awardee, you have to go through these logistic logistic problems and when I say logistic problems you know I have a, a last mile logistic woes so typically the last mile and that is getting it to the people that actually need the food that's covered in your program expenses uh, the way this program was set up that last mile that actually the most important part for us getting the food to the people who need it was not covered um, and that has created a lot of headaches, frankly. Um, I think with you're lucky enough to have a provider that is willing to work with you, willing to listen, um, you can work those things out. But throughout the Feeding American Network, there are a lot of inconsistencies as far as if your supplier for those boxes 
was going to be willing to help you make sure it gets to the people? Or are you as the food bank going to take on that financial and transportation burden and make sure that happens? Um, you know, USDA, uh, they were open as far as feedback um, to, you know, how, how the program was working uh, for food banks and for these suppliers. And I must say, uh, our congressional representation, they have been uh, very much um, wanting to know if this program is working for the food banks and making sure that it's, it's helping feed hungry West Virginians. Um, you know, you check that box when it's the financial aid for food suppliers once the grant's awarded. Uh, that portion of it, it I, think it's, I think it's been successful. Um, I think we've had some real struggles as far as making sure that it's working for the food banks. Um, Kelly, if you could do the next slide. All right, um, I wanna bring up a, a big concern of ours moving forward when we talk about, unfortunately, we don't know when the pandemic and when this huge increase in need is gonna end. Um, if we look at TFAP, which has been one of the main programs that has enabled us to respond to that huge increase in need, uh, the deliveries, the orders that are confirmed moving forward, there's a drop off, there's a huge drop off. So at the same time that we are gonna be asking our food banks to do more and more, the main resource that they have to do more and more is going to be grossly cut. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, the TFAP funding uh, through those two coronavirus bills. Um, you know, in the Families First Act, there was $600 million provided, and the CARES Act, um, through both those, I apologize. You know, right now, there's only been uh, $375 million spent in this fiscal year. So more than likely, that will carry over. Uh, there's been $1.1 billion in trade mitigation purchases. There's been 700 million in bonus purchases and 104 million in TFAP entitlement. Um, if you, we look ahead right now to fiscal year 2021, and this slide, um, it was taken from a recent Feeding America um, presentation, and these are the most up-to-date um, TFAP numbers that are available. Uh, we don't have any trade food purchases uh, coming up, um, and that is a big issue. Uh, we'll have 500 million in TFAP entitlement for fiscal year 21 that carries over from the previous year, uh, but there's gonna be a huge gap when it comes to making sure that one of our most valuable resources and a critical response uh, has, is ready, frankly. Um, so, you know what we're hoping for in the next fiscal year, um, those bonus purchases, while they're uncertain this early in the federal year, we're hoping for 600 million in those purchases. Um, it's going to be challenging to replace the large amount of food USDA Foods has purchased and distributed in that program uh, over the last two years. But again, this is something when we talk about what should we be advocating for to make sure that West Virginians are gonna be set up for success and their battle for food insecurity, uh, this cliff, this, this, we don't have anything on the books as far as purchasing and replenishing that coffer to make sure that people are fed. It's a huge concern. Um, Kelly, if you go to the next slide. Um, these are potential policy improvements that we see. Um, you know, Alexandra mentioned the many federal waivers um, what, for, for child nutrition programs for all of these programs. Uh, for us, you know, specifically the summer feeding program, instead of going into one of these counties three times a week, we were able to go in there one time and give folks uh, more food. So we got kind of more bang for our buck when we talk about transportation costs, when we talk about manpower. Um, so support food banks when food banks uh, meet new and increased need. And this next package, uh, Feeding America and its member networks are hoping that we can have food bank capacity added into that next bill. And when we talk about food bank capacity, this helps us meet that, those two big increased needs, uh, transportation and storage. Uh, we wanna be able to step up, we're doing the best we can, but as far as those two items are concerned, we need help. Um, you know, establish additional storage facilities with cold storage capacity. Uh, that's going to better prepare West Virginia in the future um, if there is another emergency of this scale. And it's just also going to allow, you know, a greater ability to source and store food, um, you know, maintain and increase TFAP funding purchase levels. 
uh, we just saw the slide that showed that huge, tremendous drop off as far as available funds and foods to provide uh, for Americans in need. Um, you know, if USDA doesn't act, we're still going to be relying on food banks to meet this increased need, and the food banks aren't going to have the resources and the food that they need to meet that need. Uh, the CFAT program. Right now, um, Congress is the only one that has the authority to continue that program. Uh, it's scheduled to run out of money and run out of authority. However, if that is something that uh, Congress should uh, act to actually extend, uh, it needs to include that last mile funding for food banks or mandate that awardees take that on. Um, Alexandra mentioned uh, how important SNAP is. Uh, we would love to see an increase in SNAP, a 15% increase in that. You know, SNAP allows us, uh, it takes the pressure off of the food banks because it can do so much more um, than food banks. And it's also a great asset for the communities. It has a tremendous economic impact. Um, on the state level, we would love to see the distribution of the 1 million for community food pro programs for the state's two food banks. Um, not sure where that is right now. And lastly, on a mix of state and federal level, uh, allocating CARES funding to support food security within the state. And that can go so many different ways, whether it goes to food banks, whether it goes to your uh, organizations on the ground that are helping people, but there is a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of need. So we would love to see some of that allocated out. And Kelly, that's, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and your adorable dog. And this is, again, a, just a wealth of information. We really appreciate this. And so next up is Spencer Moss. Spencer is the executive director of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. She's been with them since 2015. And during her time with the coalition, she has ushered in programming and policy work that support food security and food access in West Virginia communities. Programming includes creating SNAP Stretch, a program that doubles and triples SNAP EBT dollars at farmers markets and local retailers, and the West Virginia Rural Grocers Network, which has helped provide funding and technical assistance support to grocers as they establish themselves in rural community communities. The coalition also coordinates Food for All, a coalition of organizations that develop and advocate for proactive food security policies in the state of West Virginia. Um, so, Spencer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and again, thank you to the sponsors of the event. Um, I'm really excited. I'm a little bit of a policy wonk, um, so I'm really excited to talk about some specific policy ideas um, that su could support food security in the state of West Virginia. Um, so I, I'm sort of wearing two hats today. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. We're 501c3. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Uh, we were planning on a giant hog roast to celebrate our 10th anniversary, but um, the virus has thwarted those plans. So maybe in a couple years, we'll have our 15th anniversary and, and have a big hog roast. Um, so, so I'm wearing my hat as the executive director of the Food and Farm Coalition, and we, we do programming around food and farm businesses and economic development and viability. We also do policy work that supports this economic development viability for food and farm businesses. Um, the second hat I'm wearing is we coordinate the Food for All Coalition. And so we joke that we're the coalition of coalitions. Um, but Food for All is a whole bunch of organizations that care about food access or food security policy. And we come together um, every year to put a slate of policies together um, to, to lobby for at the state legislature. <clears throat> and um, our annual conference is actually coming up November 16th through 20th. Um, more info will be coming out about that later this week. Um, so I'll kind of dive back and forth between both hats today, but hopefully it's fairly seamless. Um, I do want to say the theme sort of for my presentation is, is two things that are going to come up a lot. One is policies that support programs and two, supporting farmers, right? So we're the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. Clearly, I'm going to have a bent to supporting uh, West Virginia agriculture as we work towards um, food security. Um, so Kelly, if you'll hit that next slide for me. Um, so 
I like to start this off by telling a, a story and sort of talking about our position and all of this work. Uh, I had a potential funder in my office a couple of years ago. They were from California. And we were talking about food and farm coalition programming and the work we've done around food access and the policy work we've done around food access. And I said to this person, you know, our organization really lives at the intersection of food security and farm viability. And he looked at me and he said, how could you possibly do this? Um, you know, the rules of capitalism put these, put these two sectors at odds with each other. And, and I said, I don't know, I do it every day. Um, Needless to say, we didn't get funding because um, he didn't think that we could live where we live, but we have and we continue to live in this space. Um, and we continue to live here for a couple of reasons. 2018, uh, we did a study with West Virginia University Food Justice Lab. And one of the, the key takeaways from that study is that our farmers said one of their biggest motivations for farming is that they want to feed their communities. And it, since we understand that as a key motivation for our farmers, it is an easy, easy, easy sell to couple food access, programming, food access, purchasing, and farm viability. <clears throat> the second point, the second reason we live here is you guys have probably seen this bumper sticker, no farms, no food. And it's a completely over, overly simplified bumper sticker because um, it's really a question about food sovereignty and um, the ability of states or regions or communities to produce their own food supply. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but this is, this is really important to us. You know, if we want farmers in West Virginia or farmers in the region to continue to support food, um, the consumption of food in this region, we have to support them. Um, and so with the pandemic underway, we've seen a lot of disruptions in the supply chains. Um, well, Kelly, we hit the next slide. So Caitlin alluded to this, but how many of you guys saw an image similar to this about six months ago? And this was before we saw any supply chain disruptions. This was just that moment, this panic moment, panic purchasing. Um, you know, and I think I'm sure a lot of you guys have still experienced where it's really hard to get certain items at the grocery store still. Um, not, not as bad as it was a few months ago. But, but it can be challenging. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, the, the disruptions in national supply chains have, have led to a really interesting conversation around how local and regional agriculture can really support a community. Um, and that being said, West Virginia farmers have really stepped up to the plate this year and they've had record breaking seasons in terms of, of sales. Um, and again, part of the work of the Food and Farm Coalition part of our policy work is supporting West Virginia farmers so that they can produce food for us. Um, and again, one of the themes to the presentation is policies that support or develop programming. Um, and I say that, uh, and of course, I'm going to talk about the absolute opposite of that for a moment. Kelly, will you hit the next slide? Um, so this is a project that Food and Farm Coalition uh, undertook this season at the prompting of some philanthropic funding. Um, I see one of those funders here today. Hello, Jana. It's nice to, to see your name. Um, we developed a project called, with a, with a handful of funders um, called uh, Farm to Senior. So what we did is we went to some farmers and we said, hey, if we give you X amount of money, can you work with your neighbors to grow, aggregate, distribute, um, harvesting is part of that process as well. Um, boxes to low income senior facilities who are having trouble accessing food during the pandemic. Not a single producer that I went to turned me down. Um, all of them were happy to do it. All of them came back to me and said they want to do more of this. And I think this is a really interesting idea that we played with as a result of philanthropic dollars, but I think it could inform some policy decisions moving forward. Um, so I just sort of wanted to show some imagery of that. Um, these, uh, the bearded fellow there, his name's Ed Daniels. He's in the Elkins area. Um, they aggregated from a handful of farms to support uh, Randolph County. Um, but we had folks all over, the, all over the state doing this project for us. Um, next slide. I wanna transition to talk about some policy wins that we've had in the past. Um, and this is food and farm hat, but also food for all hat. So one of, the, one of the policy wins that we had was the farm to food bank tax credit. So this 
tax credit gives farmers 10% um, of the value of products that they donate to a nonprofit food and food oriented entity up to a $2,500 tax credit, not to exceed $200,000 in a year statewide. Um, I think it was a really interesting idea. I think it was a step in the right direction. I don't think that it has been, uh, been able to be implemented all that well, unfortunately. But nevertheless, it was a really interesting food security policy that was won a few years ago. Um, shared table legislation. So there's shared table legislation in the schools. And so uh, the Food for All Coalition this year worked together on getting similar legislation at uh, senior centers, um, particularly places for congregate feeding. Of course, we're not doing any congregate feeding this year, but, um, but it would allow any leftovers to be taking, taken home by seniors, reducing food waste, but increasing food security for low-income seniors. It was a tiny, tiny win, but these are all things that are sort of a step in the right direction. Um, another policy piece that was won a couple of years ago was it was a repeal on the uh, the ability of um, former drug felons to access SNAP. At the time, West Virginia was only one of three states that still had this ban on SNAP ac access for former for former in individuals that formerly had drug felonies. Um, and so uh, American Friends Service Committee, they worked on this piece of legislation for a couple of years. The first year that Food for All formed as a coalition, I think we were able to, to kind of come under them and support American Friends Service Committee in getting this, this legislation through, but it was a huge win um, and a huge step in the right direction. And so lastly, the, uh, another is, is a win, 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 loss sort of a piece. So the, the, food, the food for All Coalition sort of got its roots when a bunch of the organizations that are a part of it right now fought a bill for three years together that essentially removed a waiver for ABODs or able-bodied adults without dependents um, in terms of their access to SNAP. Um, and so uh, it was a bill, it sort of initially went through and uh, affected just nine, nine of the most uh, well-off counties in the state of West Virginia. Um, and then they were supposed to do a study to see what the results would be in terms of food insecurity in those counties. The results of that study are still actually pending all of these years later. But the preliminary information coming from the food bank is they saw direct spikes in the need at the food bank at the time that this bill sort of was implemented in those nine counties. What we were able to do, however, as a coalition um, is keep a lot of sort of the, the worst elements of this bill out. Um, so there was some asset testing um, involved. There was a few other elements and the work of the coalition, you know, we, we were able to pull out the worst aspects of it before the bill passed. And I think you know that's super helpful um, in in moving this forward. And I think there's an opportunity actually to sort of repeal this bill later this year, um, or really 2021, given given the effects of the pandemic. Um, okay, jump with me to the next slide. Let's talk about the previously introduced legislation. More like not yet one legislation. Let's go with that. Um, so there have been a number of bills introduced that would really do a great job in supporting food security and, and some of that does a good job in supporting local agriculture, right? Which is the lens for which I view things. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an important moment to mention that the reason, I mean, beyond, beyond supporting farms so they can continue to feed us, one of the reasons we really like to support local agriculture is because when products are picked in California and they take two weeks to get here, they, they lose the bulk of their nutritional value, right? So if you're getting an item that was picked that morning, picked at the peak of freshness, when it's as ripe, of it, as ripe as it's going to get, it has its peak nutritional value. And so that is providing more um, health benefits for the individuals that are consuming those items, right? So there's this really great tie in to health, as, uh, health and nutrition, as well as just food access. Um, a couple years ago, we introduced a bill called the Healthy Food Crop Block Grant, where we would support farmers um, with a block of funding at the beginning of the season to produce uh, a certain type of crops that would specifically be sold into food access markets, and we had guaranteed markets for that. 
Um, this bill made it through the Senate, died in the House. We couldn't get buy-in from the House Finance Committee. Um, we worked on a bill last year to institutionalize SNAP stretch within state government. Um, Kelly mentioned it in the intro, but SNAP stretch is a program Food and Farm operates that doubles and triples SNAP EBT dollars at farmers markets, on farm stands, um, mobile markets. There's a handful of retailers in the state we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, this program has been wildly successful this year. By comparison, um, 2019, $53,000 rolled through in SNAP stretch. Um, this year, we had to cut the program off in July at $158,000. So six weeks into the season, um, a lot of brand new sites operating the program. Some of them only had it off the ground for two weeks. And we, you know, $158,000 out the door, done. We had no more funding. Um, but it would be interesting to see Department of Health and Human Resources or potentially Department of Agriculture operate this program so that it's, it's institutionalized and will we'll roll forward um, indefinitely. Um, another bill was creating comprehensive summer feeding plans um, that re would require every county to have a plan to feed kids. And I think um, there's a couple of counties that do a really good job with this, Putnam County being one of, the, or Cabell County, excuse me, being one of them. Um, and I think the pandemic really only highlighted the need to have these plans in place and the bill would require um, counties to have these plans in place. I'm going to echo my colleagues, 15% and the maximum limit on, on EBT SNAP. Um, I think Alex mentioned this initially, but according to Pew Research, more than half of low income families have lost wages or jobs as a result of the pandemic. These families are likely already on SNAP EBT. Um, a good chunk of them are likely already receiving the maximum benefit. So just because they lost wages or lost their job doesn't mean that they're going to receive any more federal food assistance. And so this 15% increase would help those families. We also saw this was a strategy that was implemented in the 20, 2008 recession. And it was this extraordinarily successful strategy that really thwarted um, hunger issues. It also takes the pressure off of our friends at the food, or helps, it will help take the pressure off of our friends at the food bank. Um, so I think another piece, getting back to the CFAP program that Caitlin was talking about, um, this program, you know, the USDA unveiled it. They said it was to help farmers. I, you know, I think it was sort of thinly veiled that it was also really designed to help uh, businesses uh, that are food aggregators or transporters that aren't, weren't able to be transporting food to institutions or to restaurants at the time. And so I think it was a great idea, but I think what happened in, in implementation is that it didn't take, um, the organizations such as the food banks into consideration with regards to how it would play out on the ground. By comparison, I, you know, uh, well, let me say this. There were no, there were several entities in the state of West Virginia that applied to be part of this program, put in a bid to aggregate and distribute agricultural product to our friends at the food bank. Um, and none of them were selected. And I think the difference is um, because we know that our farmers are motivated by feeding their communities, um, we know that they would do a really good job of producing high quality product um, and getting it sort of that last mile that Caitlin was talking about. And I think we see this because um, Turnrow Appalachian Farm Collective is an aggregator. They were on um, a contract this year with uh, Mountaineer Food Bank to do 400 food boxes weekly. And I did a little bit of research with the food bank and asked, you know, what was, what was that like by comparison to um, sort of some of the other operations at the food bank or some of the results of the CFAP program? And they just didn't, they, they couldn't say enough things about the variety that came in the boxes. They couldn't say enough things about um, the extra mile that, that turn row went. And so I think that I recognize the USDA was just trying to get a bunch of, um, uh, money out the door quickly to feed people. I think it could have been really helpful um, to to um, include 
Appalachian folks or West Virginians in this program as well and to really sort of dig into to applications coming from communities. Um, and so finally, sort of on this slide is another really interesting bill, um, the Healthy, Healthy Food Access for All Americans Act. So this was a bill that was introduced by Senator Capito um, Moran of Kansas, Warner of Virginia, and Casey of Pennsylvania. And so this bill would create grants or tax credits to service providers who were developing grocery stores in low access communities. And this is a really interesting piece of legislation that would promote access in communities that are otherwise losing their, their grocery stores. And so this, this is not yet one, um, it goes into that category, but I'm really interested in reaching out and trying to support this moving forward now that the Food and Farm Coalition has sort of dove into to grocery store work. Um, <clears throat> so just sort of um, bringing things to, to wrapping things up a little bit um, and on this idea of policies that support programs. So the, the Farm Bill, the biggest food oriented bill um, in the country does grant programs um, or does it has grant programs, excuse me, that support really innovative access to to food. Um, so snap stretch, for example, is was it was from a grant that was designated in the farm bill. Kelly, if you'll hit the next slide. Um, another program was the healthy food financing initiative and this the food and farm coalition access this grant and helped three grocery stores get off the ground this year, partially last year, partially this, this year. And as a result, we're helping more grocery stores get off the ground, right? So there's, there's policy that has informed programming and now we're seeing food access benefits. This is from one of our sites in Princeton. If you'll hit the la or next slide for me. Um, I think that the state has an amazing opportunity to support policies um, that support food access programs. For example, Food and Farm Coalition through the Department of Ag just received $100,000 in CARES Act funding to support SNAP stretch for the remainder of the season. Um, there are other communities such as New Mexico and Texas that have capital improvement funds that encourage many grocery stores in rural communities or low income communities. Um, Massachusetts has a healthy incentives program that's similar to SNAP stretch ran through their Department of Health and Human Resources. Um, there could be programs that support revenue generating mobile markets um, that, that take produce to communities that are in rural spaces. Um, and then I think the other piece that would be really interesting here is to support effective um, childhood education programming so that as we sort of normalize access to, to nutritious foods um, through, through extension and through the school systems, there could be policies that support funding and support these kinds of programs. Um, I think would be super helpful. Um, and I think coming from the state would be really interesting because it would support culturally appropriate uh, programming in West Virginia in rural communities. And it would also likely be part of a statewide comprehensive plan around food security. And I think that would be a really interesting policy piece to work on. And the last slide I'll leave you with, Kelly, um, is one more USDA program that was designated in the Farm Bill that Food and Farm has had access to. This is a mobile market, it's the Go Grocery Market. Um, it operates in McDowell County. Um, it visits 22 low-income neighborhoods that do not have access to a grocery store and delivers all of these items to communities. It accepts SNAP, it accepts SNAP Stretch. Um, kind of a fantastic policy to program. Um, project. All right, I'm done. Sorry, I'm over time. Unmute myself. Thank you so much, Spencer. That's, again, a lot of information, and um, I look forward to going back and watching this and typing it all out so we make sure everybody gets all of this um, important info. And we are running out of time, but we have one wonderful presenter I hope that you stick around for. Um, she is our final presenter today, and her name is Candace Hamilton. Candace is the Assistant Director of Project Watch. West Virginia's birth score program in the Department of Pediatrics at West Virginia University, and the executive director of the West Virginia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Since completing her master's of public health at WVU in 2004, she has worked closely with West Virginia maternal and infant birth outcome data, 
substance use during pregnancy and public health policy. Through her experience as a court appointed special advocate and foster parent, she has developed a passion for advocacy to protect and improve kids' health in our state. She is a staunch advocate for West Virginia Kids Health. She is a board member of Think Kids, and she coordinates an annual Tiny Hearts Day at the Capitol, which is uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics Day of Advocacy. And with all of that, um, welcome Candace. Thank you, Kelly. And um, I just feel so honored to be wrapping up this amazing summit series with such smart people who, who really are the experts in, um, <laughs> in this topic. What I am passionate about is figuring out how to get that picture that Spencer ended with into legislation that pediatricians can help with. And so that I think is what my goal is today to kind of talk briefly about what pediatricians are doing in our state, but then how we can engage our chapter um, with partners in our state to really um, advocate for kids at the state level and get policy into place that will benefit them um, with health, overall health, focusing on hunger and obesity. Next slide, Kelly. Uh, Kelly mentioned the Tiny Hearts Day, and that has been my favorite part about working with pediatricians in the state. Three years ago, um, kudos to Kelly because she really did help fund our first event. Our president was a pediatric cardiologist at the time, so he thought um, Valentine's Day and a love for little tiny hearts was perfect to name it that and it stuck. Really what it has done is open the door for a relationship with pediatricians who may not know much about advocacy and legislative policy work um, and has provided a a relationship with legislators. We now have legislators texting us during um, the legislative um, season and it really has become a way for them to rely on experts for science and data, um, which is really important as we all know right now. We have a guiding document called the West Virginia Blueprint for Children. I'm not gonna go into all of our priorities for the sake of time, but obesity prevention has been included in our blueprint for the last three years. And, and due to COVID, things like um, what we've talked about today are probably going to be included in addition to specifically obesity. Um, so on a federal level, our chapter also participates in what they call fly-ins, where they will fly in every executive director and president from each chapter in the country um, to meet with federal, um, federal senators um, and delegates. And it really has been a wonderful experience for me as an advocate for health. Um, specifically, our chapter has also engaged with legislators at the federal level around all of these important programs that you've just learned about, SNAP, WIC, school breakfast and lunch. And I think during the pandemic, we have signed on to many letters that have, have really, um, spoken up for kids in West Virginia for everything you've heard about today. Next slide, Kelly. This is the inside of the blueprint for children and I put a star next to the obesity prevention and treatment because really our pediatricians are seeing these kids um, sometimes when it's too late. The goal is to prevent this from happening, right? And so um, we also know that food insecurity can lead to obesity, which some people scratch their head over that. But um, I think the speakers before me have done an excellent job in discussing the other medical conditions that can occur from insecurity as well as eating too much. Next slide. So it's more than obesity prevention and treatment. And I, I really don't even wanna take time to go over these facts I've included. They've been discussed today, but we know that we have a lot of kids who are living in food insecure households and it really does impact their development, um, behavioral problems, obesity, poor growth and um, inappropriate feeding practices in their home. Next slide. So there is a toolkit and National AAP does a, a wonderful job at providing resources for our members to access and implement. And that can be from the ground level to educating and training staff, even educating and training pediatricians, um, scheduling scheduled meetings for the office, and then screening. 
And so I know Alexandra talked about screening too, and um, really how we can make those screenings um, a part of the workflow, documenting and coding appropriately, and then what to do when we have a screen. Next, next slide. These are the two questions from the hunger, hunger vital sign. They were touched upon earlier about the validated and AAP recommended, recommended two question food insecurity screening tools. Unfortunately, these screening questions are not included in EPIC, which is the um, largest EMR in our state. Um, within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Within the past months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. So a patient screens positive for food insecurity if the response is often true or sometimes true. And just polling my coworkers in the Department of Pediatrics in Morgantown, we are not asking these. This is not documented in EPIC. And a few of them scratch their heads about, well, we do ask, we do ask, but we don't ask those questions. So I think making sure that these toolkits exist, but how are they implemented into the medical record and, and how do we code and how then do we connect when we do screen? Next slide. So I think that's one big problem and I've seen this across the spectrum of other um, West Virginia Children's Health Priority ACEs being one of them that was discussed a lot in the last legislative session. More screenings and then what? What if we don't have resources? What if we don't know what to do? So unfortunately, federal and state community-based programs are not directly linked to healthcare. And oftentimes we've heard from providers during this series, they just aren't aware or aren't sure of what to do with those screening results. Next slide. I spoke to the expert in our chapter several times before speaking briefly today, Dr. Jamie Jeffrey, who um, is, is just a huge champion in a very small chapter. And she said, there really is no excuse for not screening anymore. All providers can refer to West Virginia 211 and figure out the local resources that exist in their community um, for, for food. And so I think I just wanted to um, reinforce that I do think part of it is training our own providers about the resources that are out there and really getting them to the table to hear everything that I've learned today from our speakers previously. Next slide. I mentioned Dr. Jamie Jeffrey and she wasn't available today. She is the expert around obesity and she has an amazing, um, just an amazing passion, but really just um, her, her um, keys for healthy kids. I just want to make sure everyone is aware of it. It really is focused on creating environments that um, produce healthier habits and behaviors and it's based on policy system and environmental change and if you have a minute to check out her website um, keysforhealthykids.com I really think it's important um, that we increase awareness about um, resources that that are present in our state but building partnerships uh, mobilizing the community assessing your environment these are just five points that really kind of summarize the foundation her program is built on and yes, she's a clinician treating you know, children who have BMIs that are very high, but she also is really understands the, the importance of um, taking everything you've talked about, making policy change and really ch shaping the overall environment for our kids. And we really, we have to change our approach in West Virginia. Next slide. Um, she has introduced to our membership and done a small pilot study um, last year, the 5210RX intervention, it's basically this based on the pediatric obesity clinical decision support chart. So we're encouraging five or more fruits or vegetables, two hours or less of screen time, one hour or more of physical activity and zero sugary drinks and water is best. That was the policy if I had time to get into our blueprint for children that we have supported for the last three years, um, increasing the tax on sugar and sweet beverage. Um, we haven't been successful with that um, over time as we'd hoped. So 
um, we, that won't fall off our radar, but um, it really is key to, to this 5210RX intervention. This just shows you a sample script um, that actually a pediatrician would, would give to a family for a child. And can you imagine, next slide, if, um, if every pediatrician were to then give a child or a family $20 to go to that pop-up um, grocery market in their community? Um, and so they did this small pilot um, with our, our previous chapter president, Dr. Tracy Acklin, who was the only pediatrician in four counties in Montgomery. And um, I think I've talked to Dr. Acklin and Jamie has also shared that the outcomes were very positive. Younger children um, tend to do better. So that means pediatricians need to refer earlier. Um, so not only are they, they're collecting data on their actual health outcomes, but encouraging a healthy lifestyle and making food accessible for these kids at farmers markets, um, capital market. She has, she has many, many examples of ways to make this um, a reality and we need to be doing this. Next slide. Um, in the future, when COVID permits us to meet and do trainings, um, Dr. Jeffrey will be rolling this out to our entire membership. I think her goal is to also really uh, train residents so that we're training people earlier and prevention and policy and environment change um, so that we can make a difference earlier in these kids' lives. Um, so we will be doing many trainings in the next year to, um, to hopefully roll out this program. I'm just giving you one example during my short time, but I think um, I see so many opportunities for collaboration, and I think it's important that we continue to connect and figure out how we can um, use, use these examples for um, policy. Next slide. I think that we just had our fall board executive committee meeting this past weekend, and we looked at that blueprint for children and discussed how COVID has really um, increase what we may need to include for next year. And I think everyone has done a great job on talking about how COVID has either highlighted what we're doing really well or where we have some work to do. And so food insecurity and screening for that, I think, um, as well as nutrition during a, during a pandemic, what do, those, what do those feeding programs look like and what is the nutritional value of the food that we are making sure these families have during these times? Next slide. So I think from, from my perspective as someone who works with pediatricians, but also works with data on a daily basis, I think that just all of this um, information today is so important that we continue to educate providers as well as families um, and state partners about what we need to do. I think screening um, from the pediatric primary care level is very important. I don't think it's happening as it should be documenting um, and coding and then referring using West Virginia 211. Um, all of this information, how can we filter it to providers as well so they're aware of programs in their community that they may or may not know how to access. And then I think as Spencer said, advocating for really important policy and collaborating together. I think we can do so much more together um, especially if we have certain policies, um, I would encourage anyone to reach out to me directly um, and, and let the chapter help engage as well. Um, this quote that I've heard at AAP meetings so many times, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. This is a picture of Dr. John Phillips, one of our presidents with uh, Shelly Moore Capito at the Capitol fly-in. And I think it's so important for um, pediatricians to, to really be a voice and, um, on policy for kids' health. Next slide. Oh, that's it. That's all I have. So um, <laughs> thank you so much again for the opportunity to speak. And if you have questions for, um, for experts in children's health, like Dr. Jeffrey, I'd be happy to connect you. Oh, thank you so much, Candace. And I know we're a little bit over time. I appreciate everyone who has stuck in uh, here with us. And I'm appreciative of those. I'm reading through the chat. And I love how people actually answered the questions. And what I'm going to do is um, when I send a follow up to everyone who was present today, I'm going to send you a copy of the uh, chat discussion. 
Um, so you will have that. And I'll also put a copy of the slides on our G drive because there was so much information, um, it would be helpful for you to have that as access. And while um, I'm looking at the Q&A box, uh, quickly uh, for anyone, but especially the panelists, if you could choose one policy change at the state level, it can be something that requires legislation or at a department level, what is your highest priority? Well, I th so this is Spencer. I think I responded in the chat, but um, I'm starting to become a bigger fan of sort of comprehensive plans that are guiding document that could guide how funding to food access or food security programs operate. Um, so I think that would be uh, would be what I would advocate for. So legislation um, that would create a comprehensive plan and then funding to support making that plan happen in a dream world. Hi, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think the the policy I would love is for the state to make sure they're using every available federal dollar for nutrition programs and um, adopting permissible policies that can expand the reach and, and sometimes um, the, the benefit level for programs. Um, so these programs are a great gift and um, too often states leave money at the table and you know don't connect everyone who's eligible to SNAP. Um, because they have po they put policy barriers that get in the way. So looking at how you can leverage federal dollars. Thank you, Alex. Anyone else? I'll go ahead and go. Um, in that dream world, as far as the food banks, we would love legislation that creates access to funding uh, to build a large facility, storage facility, um, that, that works with both the food banks, but also allows for collaboration uh, amongst state agencies so we can better respond uh, during normal times and, you know, during a pandemic and emergencies. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. If you put something in the chat box or Q&A, again, I will share that with everyone so they'll have access to your input. Um, our next step um, as Think Kids is a couple of things to keep this ball rolling. We're gonna write an issue brief on all the information we've gotten from all four sessions. And we're gonna make that available around early December because we wanna make sure that our policymakers have that in hands for fiscal year 2021. Um, we're gonna be working with Keys for um, Healthy Kids, Dr. Jamie Jeffrey, as Candace mentioned. And we're gonna do um, some Facebook Live sessions where We'll discuss the connection between food insecurity and obesity. And we're going to work with Marshall University's um, dietitian program um, because we're, they have some um, graduate assistants who are going to provide a couple of videos on how to cook some nutritious meals um, that are inexpensive around the holidays. And so that's just a few things, but we would love any input we, you have um, on how to keep this dialogue going after the series ends. And we really look forward to getting that brief out and furthering dis the discussion. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us for all four sessions. Thanks to Unicare, thanks to all the panelists, and thanks to those of you who joined us for each one. Um, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.